Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I wanted to look at the infantry of the Imperial Guard and later we'll be doing a separate episode on the cavalry. But Tim, I hear the voices that speak in my head cry. You've already done an awesome and fully comprehensive series on the Imperial Guard. Except the auxiliary troops which you keep promising you'll do and we've not seen sight or sound of. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you'd be right by, to say that. But today we're not going to be looking at the bare-skinned wearing Legion d'honneur members of Napoleon's Imperial Guard. No, today we are going to be looking at the finest sons of Europe. Ones who were, quote, a sight too beautiful to describe. Today we're talking about the Imperial Guard infantry of Russia. Now I'm going to warn you before we get started, you're going to need to strap in, get yourself a new cup of tea or open a fresh bottle, because this is going to be an absolute mammoth of an episode. So, after my month off, I'm feeling more energised. Let's get into it. Following the revolt of his royal guard, the Streltsy, and their very bloody execution, Peter the Great created an imperial guard. I'm going to have an aside even <laughs> at the end of the first sentence. The reason that Red Square is called Red Square is due to the brutal execution of the Streltsy. Peter had 500 of them hung, 500 of them beheaded, and 500 of them torn apart by horses. So he was super not impressed with the Streltsy Revolt. As a child, he had been given two regiments of actual soldiers to play war games with, which, <laughs> I'm not going to lie, sounds pretty epic. These two regiments were to be the core of his new formation. The, and I'm going to apologise in advance for the mispronunciation here. In fact, going forward, I think it's probably safe to assume that I'm going to butcher pretty much any Russian name, which is going to be a problem in this video, so I hope you'll bear with me. So, these two regiments, the Priobrazhensk and the Semenovsk Lifeguard Regiments, they would fight bravely in the Great Northern War, with Charles II allowing them and them alone to keep their arms and colours after the army's surrender, so even he was impressed by them. Catherine the Great formalised them as guard, and by 1800 they had been joined by three battalions of the Ismailovsk lifeguards, and a battalion of lifeguard Jaegers. This took the guard to 11 battalions, the Prio Brazhensk having four, and the Semenovsk having three. Now, this is an absolutely huge number of guard, far more than Napoleon's old guard, even at its height. And here we're going to see the first part of the problem the guard had. They were no longer soldiers. They were baubles, with a minimum height of 5 foot 6, which, <laughs> which was pretty tall then, or 175 centimetres for our metric lovers. These were men that looked good flanking the doors of the Winter Palace, made excellent dancing partners at the endless grand balls of St. Petersburg, and, if the almost certainly false rumours about Catherine are to be believed, also excellent nocturnal companions for her, shall we say. But whether those rumours were true or not, what can't be denied is that these were chocolate box soldiers. These weren't the grizzled veterans of Napoleon's old guard. Additionally, they recruited on position, not merit, leading many officers to have achieved their rank not only not having ever seen battle, but in some cases not even being old enough to shave. Catherine's successor, Tsar Paul, was a great Prussiaophile and commanded his guard to learn a Prussian drill, which is why even today we see videos of modern Russian army goose-stepping. While it does look awesome, it was outdated by 1800 and very unpopular amongst the men, even if it was eagerly advanced by the Tsar's brother and commander of the guard, Grand Duke Constantine, a man obsessed with drill and uniforms, I think he'd have been right at home amongst Napoleonic wargamers. We've seen quite a lot of him throughout this story as, a, as well. Tsar Paul pruned the officer corps and introduced accountability into units. Again, not so popular. There was practical benefit to these reforms, however, as they did instill some combat effectiveness into the formation, with the much stricter discipline and high quality of training being transferable skills onto the Napoleonic battlefield. If one believes that Tsar Paul was assassinated, and I for one do, then it's very difficult to believe that the Guard weren't either actively involved or at the very least turned a blind eye to it, given his unpopularity. After Tsar Paul's death, his son Alexander took the throne, and he was much more competent than his father, despite or perhaps because of the qualities that led Napoleon to describe him as, quote, a shifty Byzantine, end quote. 
Alexander's attitude to Napoleon switched from loathing to almost adoration and back again. And at this point, he hated Napoleon with a burning passion, feeling a divine calling to oppose the French. The guard would be the tip of the spear in these attempts and taking the field in 1805. On a cold December morning in 1805, the red sun of Austerlitz rose over the battlefield and saw the guard positioned to the north of the place where the majority of the heavy fighting took place, the Pratzen Heights. This put them on the extreme right of the Allied line against perhaps one of Napoleon's most elite divisions, that of General Rivaux under the command of Marshal Lann. While the right of the line is traditionally the place of honour, this was not where the crux of the fighting would take place. And this is another example of how the thinking of these commanders was more suited to 1705 than 1805. Auschwitz is quite a long battlefield, and it meant that by having the guard where they would traditionally be, they weren't against Napoleon's guard, they were just against one of his veteran divisions, and it meant that they couldn't play the role that was maybe needed in the central conflict for the Pratzen Heights. I'm not going to describe the entire Battle of Austerlitz here. It's a fascinating battle, arguably Napoleon's greatest victory. But we are going to talk about the guard's contribution, and I'm going to read quite a long excerpt from a book by Robert Goetz called Austerlitz, and he described it like this. Quote, As the Russian guard approached, Constantine ordered the four battalions of the Priobrazhensk and Semenovsky to fix bayonets and charge the French. At 300 paces, the Russian guardsmen surged forward with their customary Hoorah! This charge, launched at too great a distance, met with Rivaux's seasoned troops, who deployed and stood to receive the attack. The skirmishers that Rivaux had deployed in front of his first line were swept away by the charge, but the Russian troops were winded by the time they reached the main French line, and the French fire inflicted heavy losses. Despite this, the three battalions of Rivaux's first line were driven back on the second line of battalions, where the impetus of the Russian attack was halted. Colonel Rahl, commanding the Russian guard position battery, advanced his guns in support of the infantry. Before he get them into position, however, Konstantin received word of Kutuzov's orders for a general withdrawal from the heights. By around 12.30, the Russian guard infantry, covered by their cavalry and the Austrian Kaiser Kurazia regiment, had disengaged reformed and set off for Krenovitz." End quote. That wasn't the end of the guards' day, however. As the French army advanced, they launched a counter-attack, and again, I'm going to quote Goetz in this. Again, it's another quite long passage, but I think he's got a real style and a real flair that I appreciate. He said, quote, A little after midday, he, Napoleon, rapidly climbed the Stare Vino Brady, which Van Damme held firmly, and which was the best observation post for following the whole of the battle. That's on the Pratzen Heights. At that moment, he was engrossed by the highly coloured spectacle of the day, though only of secondary significance, the charge of the Russian Imperial Guard. At first, it was a matter of an infantry charge. Four complete battalions of the Russian Guard, about 3,000 men, debouched from Krenovitz and attacked Van Damme's division to the north of the Stare Vino Brady, under the orders of the Tsar's own brother, Grand Duke Constantine. They were magnificent men, giants of over six feet, clad in white and green. The Semenovsky and the Preobrajensky regiments, whose presence at the right time in certain squares of Moscow or St. Petersburg had sufficed to overthrow this Tsar or that Tsarina and have the successor proclaimed. They were insanely brave, and this would cost them dear. The Grand Duke directed them, to attack with the bayonet, but such was their enthusiasm they began to dash too soon. 300 paces from the French and reached them out of breath. Luckily for the latter, the impact of these giants was as redoubtable as that of cavalry. The first ranks of the 24th light and the 4th of the line, whose murderous fire did however sprinkle the ground with bodies, were thrust back and routed. But the second French line held everywhere. The attackers were at the end of their breath. The infantry of the Russian guard, kept remarkably well in hand by its commanders, withdrew in good order towards Krenovitz. At that moment, Van Damme's regiments thought they were clear, and the episode was all the more quickly forgotten since a very important order had just reached the division. They were to make a quarter turn to the right, leave Stare Vino Brady, where Bernadotte's troops were about to relieve them, descend to the south to help saint Hilaire, still hard-pressed towards Pratzen and taking part in the crushing of the Russian left. 
It was a matter already underway for all Van Damme's forces, except the two regiments that had just been delayed by the infantry of the Russian Guard, the 4th Line and the 24th Light, their battalions drawn up in columns and already containing sad gaps, were isolated in the middle of the Pratzen Plateau when they saw swooping down on them six squadrons of Russian cavalry. Behind the infantry, which had just been repulsed, Grand Duke Constantine was leading in person all that was available of the cavalry of the Imperial Guard. End quote. What followed is one of the greatest cavalry charges in history, but for that story you'll have to listen to part two, where we cover that when we're doing the Russian Guard cavalry. Despite the best efforts of the Russian Guard, the Austro-Russian army was thrown back. Five or six battalions of Russian Guard reached the bridge over the Rausnit stream at Krenovitz, in good order and had deployed in line. They stood 400 paces from the bridge while one battalion, the lifeguard Jaegers, had occupied the town. Behind the guard infantry, a mass of stragglers streamed towards the bridge, hotly pursued by the French who fired upon them, particularly the skirmishers of Drouet's infantry and a battery of French guard horse artillery were causing havoc on the fleeing Russians. The fire soon had an effect and the Prio Bras Hentk lifeguards suffered heavy casualties. While this was going on, the two battalions of the Semenovsk lifeguard were attacked by French cavalry under Dalman and Rapp. Goats continues, and note if I say the first or third, then a regimental like number, I'm talking about the first or third battalion. Now if you've seen my video on the Russian army, you'll know that the second battalion were the depot battalion, so that's why it's the first and third. Don't wonder, like, where's the second battalion gone? They were safely back in Kiev or... Archangel or wherever they were uh, from. So, quote, Although Dahlman is not specifically mentioned in French accounts, it seems his squadrons were unable to make any headway against the 3rd Semenovsky. A lieutenant of the Marmalukes, however, managed to hack his way into the square of the 1st Semenovsky, suffering multiple bayonet wounds and having his horse killed beneath him. His comrades immediately exploited the breach in the square, breaking it, and sending the battalion fleeing towards Krenovitz, leaving ten men and their battalion standard in the hands of the Mamelukes. A hole left in the Russian line by the route of the first Semenovsky necessitated a general retreat, and the remaining battalions began filing down the slope, still harassed by Drouet's skirmishes on their left, and now Rivo's arriving on their right. The third Ismailovsky had already crossed the Ruznitz Brook, along with three of Kostanetsky's guns, taking position on the heights on the opposite side. The light guns accompanying the infantry also seem to have crossed to the left bank by this point except for the one gun with the Semenovsky regiment that had been taken by the French. The infantry, however, were suffering from the steady fire of the French skirmishers and horse artillery, and in addition, the French guard cavalry still roamed nearby, waiting for opportunities to charge when they could catch the Russian guard infantry unprepared. End quote. Now, it's always a pleasure for me to read about the Marmooks and to see them break not only a square, but a square of Russian guard is particularly awesome for me. So I'm glad I managed to get that one in. And while the Russians had been defeated at Austerlitz, the conduct of the guard garnered them much praise, especially from other Russians. Despite one battalion breaking, the rest stood firm and kept their discipline in the retreat. These battalions were all classed as Grenadier or Jaeger, although this would change later in the war. They will be equipped with the same uniforms as their regular brethren, but of a much higher quality. I think the only real difference on a miniature would be they had like two, like collar bars. It's quite um, you'll see you'll you'll see them on the screen. They're like yellow, almost like gates that are on their collars, a bit like Second World War German uniforms. This means that Austerlitz, or indeed any other battle up to 1809, they'd have the flat shako with the toilet brush plume, as I like to call it, the big bushy one. Or later on, they'd have the kiwa, with the exclamation mark plume. Fortunately for us, the mitre was phased out just before our period. But if you're doing the very, very early campaigns, you might be able to just squeeze them in. After the reforms of 1809, individual guard regiments still were distinguishable by their facings. The Prio Braz Hensk having red facings, the Semenovsk blue, the Ismailovsk dark green facings. As it was fairly common in various guard units at the time, ranks in the guard were considered higher than their equivalent in the line, with a guard private being the same as a line NCO. In fact, it was not uncommon for successful guard NCOs to be made officers in line regiments. 
Guards officers, on the other hand, were considered two ranks higher than their line counterparts. Speaking of their contemporaries, the Russian Imperial Guard would meet with the French Imperial Guard twice in 1807, first in the blood-stained snow of battle, and then in a more pleasant fraternal occasion. During the Battle of Ilau, the sudden flurry of snow disorientated a French attack by Augereau's corps, leading to two-thirds of them being destroyed by massed Russian artillery. Seeing this gaping wound in the French line, the Russian commander Benningsen committed his reserve, the Imperial Guard. They brushed aside the scattered remnants of the French columns, still milling about in confusion in the valley between the two armies, and stormed up towards the only landmark that they could coordinate on, a windmill. The same thing that allowed the Russians to focus on this building also made it an excellent point of reference for French messages, carrying orders here and there, so Napoleon himself had set up his command post there. By 10.30am, unbeknownst to them, the Russians were within striking range of the Emperor himself, forcing his personal bodyguard to fight in order to buy time for his escape. Now when I say his personal bodyguard, I'm not talking about the Imperial Guard, I'm talking about his actual physical personal guard, the guys who got in the carriages with him, things like that, you know, his individual security detail. Now, they did succeed in allowing Napoleon to scurry away as he climbed over a wall, um, and it allowed time for the old guard to be brought up and push the Russian guard back. In the snow-filled cemetery of Ilau Church, two of the world's most formidable units fought in savage hand-to-hand -hand combat. The skill and experience of the old guard versus the self-belief and goal-focused mindset of the Russian guard. Soon, the sounds of pistol fire, of close-range musketry, of the ringing of steel as swords and muskets clashed, echoed over the frozen gravestones. But the quality of Napoleon's old guard won out, and the Russians were hurled back, managing to retreat, still in good order. Eventually, the battle would just sort of peter out into a massacre on both sides. But that was the end of the guards exertions that day but it had been a very very close run thing later that year after fighting minor actions near Gutstadt and Altkachen before the set piece battle of Heiselberg and Friedland which the Russian guard mostly sat out the time had come for an end to war on the banks of the river Tilsit a great peace festival occurred one of the greatest in history comparable I guess with the field of the cloth of gold here the French and Russian emperors met as equals, and the officers and respective guard units met in a display of solidarity. In contrast to the blood-streaked snow in the depth of winter last time these two units met, this was to be under a cloudless blue sky, the strong sun shining upon what was known as a, quote, brotherly feast, end quote. And this was a feast indeed, with meats of all kinds and both beer and brandy available. An account was left by a French attendee, but, uh, well, I, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll read the quote first, and we'll discuss it afterwards. So he said, quote, These hungry Russians could not restrain themselves. They knew nothing of the reserve which one should exhibit at table. They were given brandy to drink, which was the drink of the meal, and before offering them a glass, it was proper to drink, and then to pass them a goblet in white metal containing a quarter of a litre. The contents immediately disappeared. They swallowed a morsel of meat as large as an egg with each swig. They were quickly uncomfortable and, by signs, invited us to unbutton, as they were doing. We saw that, in order to exaggerate their manly chests, they were swathed in cloth, which we were disgusted to see them discard." End quote. <laughs> now, I really enjoy that description. It's, uh, it's, it's very evocative. But I think we need to remember that... The guard officers were nobles. I mean, we're talking high, high barons, princes, you know, that kind of thing. The 1% of the 1%. In fact, purely in social class terms, the Russian guard officers would almost certainly have been more noble, to use that term, than their French counterparts. So I find it very, very unlikely that Russian guard officers behave like this. If they'd been dining with like a Russian line unit or some Opolcheny or something, then I could maybe see it. But uh, the St. Petersburg-based 
Russian guard. <laughs> I just can't see it. But it's fun anyway, so that's why I wanted to leave it in. Now, during the uh, the peace conference, there were reviews of the troops, and Napoleon said about them after a review, quote, I was surprised by the precision and assurance of this infantry, so well disciplined and of such extraordinary firmness. Would it be the first in the world if, to these qualities, and united a little of the eclectic enthusiasm of the French, end quote. We talked about this in the video on the French army that I did. It's this X factor that made the French army of Napoleon so good. It was that, as Napoleon describes it, the eclectic enthusiasm. It's this self-belief that I think the French had and other armies didn't. And I think that was one of the key things that made the French army so good. And that's just Napoleon saying that had the Russians had that, they would have been the foremost unit in Europe. So the war in Europe was now over. Although this allowed Russia to free herself to launch a campaign against the Ottomans, the guard would not be called upon in the sweltering heat of the Caucasus. Instead, they would be sent to the frozen north in a war against Sweden. This provides one of those weird situations where the Russians, perhaps the greatest opponent of Napoleon, were now fighting to further his aims. In this instance, to ensure that the continental system was being upheld. The fact that it allowed Russia to extend her borders into what's now Finland was just, you know, a brucey bonus for them. While the fighting was fierce at times, the guard, while there, were not really required in a combat role. And by the time the, this invasion took place, the Russians had much more switched to the French practice of using the guard as a reserve. Also, the Austrians did that as well. No, no more would they be positioned on the right of the line in the place of honour. They would be as a reserve in the centre and they'd be used where they were most needed. After the successful conclusion of the Finnish war, the guard returned to their traditional role of guarding doors, dancing at balls and just looking generally good. Tsar Alexander, however, at least remembered that these were fighting men, not just flunkies, so kept up the standard of recruitment, particularly amongst the officers. In 1808, he issued a statement saying that nobility alone would no longer be enough to be considered for a role in the Guard, but only a recommendation from the foremost military academies would suffice. The formation was expanded with the creation of two new regiments, the Lithuanian and Finnish lifeguards, and these were created in a way that was very similar to how Napoleon raised his new Guard units. Each grenadier regiment was ordered to send their four best grenadiers and their two best strelki, their best shots, to the guard. The organization of the units changed too. Each battalion of the Priobrazensk and Semenovsk and Izmolovsk huh, were made up of one grenadier and three fusilier companies. Now, if I'm honest, I'm not really 100% sure why they bothered with this. They operated pretty much the same as they did before. They were all sort of shock heavy infantry. So I'm not really sure why they bothered with that. If anyone knows, please leave a comment down below. Now, all guardsmen, even after these reforms, however, still outrank their line equivalent, and they all wore their red shoulder straps. Now, again, you may have seen these on modern uh, Soviet... Well, Soviet... On modern Russian troops, particularly on Soviet-era troops. You saw, like, the red shoulder boards. Well, that comes from here, from the guard. So, yeah, I mean, whether you were a... Uh, fusilier or a grenadier of the i don't know the semenovsk battalion you still wore the same uniform as the others so i don't really know what what the thing the the point of that was but as i say if you do know please leave a comment in the description down below and uh and i'll find out so thus recently dis reorganized and expanded the guard stood more than ready than it ever had been when the storms of war broke and Napoleon invaded in 1812. The Semenovsky regiment marched out of St. Petersburg at near full strength, with 51 officers and 2,147 men. Despite there being a number of encounter battles, Kutuzov's policy of withdrawing into the interior of Russia meant that the Guard was little involved in the early days of the war. But when it was time for the Imperial Guard to fight, it was time. And it was one of the bloodiest battles the world had ever seen to that point, the Battle of Borodino. The Russian army had drawn itself on a ridge guarding the Smolensk-Moscow road and dug in. Von Clausewitz wrote, quote, 
Field works were ordered at the moment when the army arrived in position. They were in a sandy soil and open behind, destitute of all external devices, and therefore could only be considered as individual features in a scheme for increasing the defensive capabilities of the position. None of them could hold out against a serious assault, and in fact most of them were lost and regained two or three times." End quote. Slightly in front of the ridge was the river Colocha, and across this river on the French side was the village of Borodino itself, garrisoned by 12 cannons and the three battalions of the Life Guard Jaegers. The only link to the rest of the army for the Guard Jaegers was a small bridge built by a unit that we've not actually discussed yet, the Guard Sapper Battalion. Not really frontline fighters, these guys were classed as Jaegers, although instead of the black leather carbine and patch belts, they had white ones. So they were classed as Jaegers, but dressed like normal line. However, to help them stand out, their shako cords and shoulder straps were those of the heavy infantry and the guard gunners. They were red. On the south side of the bridge, the army had constructed defensive positions and stood there. Unlike Austerlitz, where the guard was positioned on the right of the line, and as I said, they now stood behind the centre of the army as a reserve. It was a much more modern use of the guard. And at last, after months of marching, the French army was about to engage the enemy. A German surgeon accompanying La Grande Armée, Heinrich von Roos, noted, quote, We'd seen the Russian position and it was good, and we saw their entrenchments and behind them masses of troops, their weapons shining in the sun. We knew they had numerous artillery, and that they would have made every effort to gather in as many troops as they could for the impending confrontation. The battle was sure to be tough for both sides, and we were convinced that our army was superior in numbers, and that we were better acquainted with the practice of war but we knew that the Russians were steady and fought obstinately even against canister." End quote. Both sides were ready, and there was only one thing left for the Russians, and it's recounted by Tolstoy in War and Peace. Quote, A church procession was coming up the hill from Borodino. First along the dusty road came the infantry in ranks, bareheaded and with arms reversed. Then behind them came the sound of church singing. The Opolcheni, both those who had been in the village and those who had been at work on the battery, threw down their spades and ran to meet the church procession. At the summit of the hill, they stopped with the icon, and Kutuzov stepped up to the icon, sank heavily to his knees, bowed to the ground, and for a long time tried vainly to raise, but could not do so on account of his weakness and weight. His white head twitched with the effort. At last he rose, kissed the icon as a child does with naively pouting lips, and again bowed till he touched the ground with his hand. The other generals followed his example, then the officers, then then with excited faces, pressing on one another, crowding and panting, and pushing and scramble the soldiers and the Opel Cheney. End quote. So, the battle's about to start. Everyone knows it's coming. We've had the church service beforehand. The procession, guarded by the guard Jaegers, came out of the village and blessed Kutuzov. After two days later, after some minor skirmishing on the 6th of September, the bloodiest day in history will begin. The battle began at dawn as Napoleon's stepson and Napoleonic figure episode contender Prince Eugène de Beauharnais led his army of Italians to assault the village of Borodino itself. As we've said, there were three battalions of Guard Jaeger in there and they found themselves facing 16 battalions of General Delzon's 13th Infantry Division. In the low mist, they quietly stalked up to the village, launching a surprise, savage attack. Writing about the battle, one author said, quote, Oh yes, there was indeed a mist that day, not in the air, but in the head of the drunken Colonel Makarov, who passed out around 6am and could not order his battalion to arms. End quote. This is further added to by Russian Chief of Staff General Yermolov's memoirs, who said, quote, there was such a widespread carelessness on the outposts of this battalion, the 3rd Guard Jaegers, defending the northern edge of the village, that many lower ranks were asleep, having taken off their uniforms. End quote. Now, as hinted there, the 3rd Battalion were positioned in the village itself, and the 1st and 2nd Battalion were formed in column behind it, between the village and the bridge. The 3rd Battalion, having been driven out of Borodino, staged a bayonet counterattack with the 2nd Battalion doing the same after delivering a volley, but the French would not be denied. Looking at these accounts, it appears the Jaegers fled the village towards the rest of the army, 
but the official version is that seeing his men exposed, Barclay de Tolle ordered the men to withdraw. Either way, soon the Jaeger fell back out of the village and across the makeshift bridge over the Kolocha in some haste. More French, actually probably Croatian, battalions had moved around the village and now fired on the fleeing mass. A Russian officer recalled, quote, The retreat was difficult and the crossing of the bridge dangerous. I have never been exposed to such deadly fire. The crush on the bridge was so strong that I was almost pushed into the river. Our men suffered heavily and quite out of proportion to the amount of time we had actually been in battle. In the space of just 10 minutes, we had lost the majority of our men and 30 officers, end quote. It would later be determined that the regiment lost 674 men and 27 officers. Guarding the bridge was another small unit of guard that we've not talked about yet, the Guard Marine Battalion. This small battalion was equipped as per the Jaegers, and to be honest, they're not really that much different from the Jaegers. We may as well just lump them in. But uh, I just wanted to drop them in, because if I don't, someone else will say, Oh, what about the Guard Marine Battalion? So here they are, defending the bridge. But even with their resistance, General de Brigade Plouzon led the four battalions of the French 106th Regiment in pursuit. But the massed fire of the Russians held them at bay long enough for the bridge to be partially destroyed. General Petrov later wrote... Quote, G- Colonel Karpenko of the 1st Jaegers then deployed my 1st Battalion from column into line and brought up Major Sibertsev's 3rd Battalion, which was formed in column of attack at a distance of 15 paces from the rear ranks of my battalion. Colonel Karpenko with my battalion, having run up the mound, fired an aimed volley at the enemy with the whole line. Our smoke from the volley was still curling in the face of the enemy, who, stricken and bewildered by the volley of my battalion, were in confusion. Our Jaegers charged with the bayonet. He continues, Since the lifeguard Jaegers, wanting to destroy the bridges after them, i.e. after they got over the, the river, had removed about ten beams at the middle of the upper bridge standing on piles, we pressed the French to the gap and into the slimy river. At the same time, our 3rd Battalion, being half-wheeled to the right, rushed from behind of my battalion to the lower pontoon bridge. Also, after a volley by the front company, charged with the bayonet, so we exterminated all enemy troops that had crossed the river. Together with their general and officers, and having marched to the left bank of the Culture River into Borodino, drove the enemy from it by our united regiment. End quote. So that's stirring stuff, and definitely confirms... The belief in Russian bayonet charges. The 106th Regiment de Line were now utterly defeated, and the Jaegers actually captured General de Brigade Plouzon, a commander of the Legion d'Honneur, who suffered the indignity of having his epaulets torn off before being sent back to General de Tolly. Now, he's listed as being killed in the rolls, and I actually think he might be buried at Borodino as well. So, he was either badly wounded when he was sent back to, you know, headquarters, or, you know, something unpleasant happened to him when he was there. So, I don't know. Having recrossed the bridge onto the French side of the Kolocha, the 1st Battalion of the Lifeguard Jaegers were then ordered to abandon the village, to go back across the river and destroy the bridges. This was done under enemy fire. The French in this sector rested and reformed to prepare an attack on the Great Redoubt. The fighting was now to move south. While later, the colonel of the... 3rd Battalion of the Jaegers, Colonel Makarov, would be bitterly criticised later. It would be more in private memoirs than official censure. The historian Alexander Mika Buridze wrote, quote, Official reports and other material contain no criticism of the lifeguard Jaegers, one of the elite units of the Russian army, and Makarov, who was accused of such gross ineptitude, was later awarded the Order of St. Vladimir 3rd Class and given command of another elite unit. The whole affair was largely suppressed, but it did find voice in the personal memoirs and letters of participants. End quote. Now, I must be said, I'm sure the capture of a French general would certainly do a lot to smooth over the incompetence of Makarov with high command. After an attack on the Grand Redoubt was turned back and some inconsequential fighting in the south, Napoleon ordered a mass cavalry attack. The Guard Brigade had been moved south to support the Fleshers if needed and from their elevated positions, they would have seen one of the greatest sights of the Napoleonic Wars. Some of the world's finest cavalry began massing about a kilometre away from the Russian lines. The 1st and 2nd French Carasiers, both regiments of Carabineers in their new brass armour, the Saxon Guard de Corps, 
all forming the head of a mighty column. Being far out of musket range, the Russian infantry, including the guard, could only form square and wait. Then, inevitably, as the tide, the cavalry began to move. One Russian officer wrote later, quote, A cloud of dust swept down on us from the left like an avalanche, and the closer it rolled, the more monstrous its dimensions appeared, end quote. Another officer in Russian service, J.M. von Heldorf, wrote, quote, The yell of, En avant! rang in our ears, and the force of the onslaught of these mighty masses almost took our breath away. The French cavalry emerged from the dust with a gleam of armour, a rattling of their scabbards, and the flashing of the sun on the metal of those helmets of theirs with the horse-tail switches. Drunk with victory, this majestic horde of cavalry pressed home its attack against our iron wall. End quote. The leading Russian squares were of stalwart men, but they had been sore tested by Freelance infantry attacks. This proved too much for them, and they were scattered by the Saxon Karaziers, who then pursued them into six battalions of Imperial Guard, three each of Lithuanian and Ismailovsk regiments. Colonel Alexander Kutuzov later wrote to General Lavrov, commander of 5th Corps. Colonel Hrapovitsky, who remained in front of the troops, ordered the three battalion columns to deploy on Enshek, the enemy, so on in like in a checkerboard formation. The enemy, trying in vain to defeat our regiment, increased the artillery fire, and although it devastated our ranks, it failed to produce any disorder amongst the men. So <laughs> the French cavalry officers at Royal 86s. Soon the enemy cavalry appeared to be right from us, and forced the 1st Battalion to leave its position and line up with the columns of the 2nd and 3rd Battalions. At the same time, Colonel... Hrapovitsky ordered columns to form squares against the cavalry. The enemy Karaziers made a vigorous attack, but quickly paid a heavy price for their audacity. All squares, acting with firmness, opened fire and delivered battalion volleys from the lateral faces. The enemy's armour proved to be a weak defence against our fire and added no courage to them. The cavalrymen quickly showed us their backs and fled in disorder. A fresh cavalry made of horse grenadiers, although probably bearskin wearing dragoons in reality, tried to remedy the failure of the attack, but was received in the same manner and fled back in shame. End quote. So again, some great stuff there. The French and Saxon cavalry attacked the Russian guard three times, and they were repulsed three times. Fedor Glinka wrote, quote, Enemy cavalry spread out as a sea, while our squares floated like islands that were washed by the copper and steel waves of enemy carasias. The Russian wind of lead met and repulsed these iron men. Around 12pm, our gallant commander, Colonel Hrapovitsky, was wounded in the thigh and ankle by canister. Shortly before that, Colonel Kozel Yaninov, the acting commander of the regiment, was also wounded by canister. After the enemy cavalry was repelled, the enemy resumed artillery fire, and his canister showered our immobile columns, end quote. Probably squares. Ivan F. Udum reported to General Lavrov later, My three Lithuanian battalions were arranged in squares, awaiting cavalry, and despite being surrounded by a superior enemy, they met him gallantly allowing him to approach to close range before delivering a battalion volley and yelling, Hurrah! They disordered and drove the enemy, inflicting heavy losses. Our soldiers were so incensed that no prisoners were taken. We lost no wounded on that occasion. End quote. So, despite a massed cavalry attack, we wouldn't see its like again until arguably Waterloo. It was of no use. The Russian squares held firm, unlike their performance at Auschwitz. Well, I mean, only one battalion at Auslitz. The cavalry had been driven off for the time being, and like a scab covering a wound, Russian troops flooded in to fill the gap ripped in the line by the Saxons. Hindering this process were a number of French skirmishers, members of the elite Friant Infantry Division, one of the best in the army, and were preparing the way for the rest of his division to attack. Ivan Udom's report continued, quote, the enemy made a second attack on the regiment, but was met with equal courage and fled to the right, while the height was occupied by the enemy skirmishers. To counter them, I dispatched the second battalion to drive the enemy back and capture the heights. Although this was accomplished with considerable success, the enemy was reinforced with several columns in this direction that supported the skirmishers, which made it impossible for my regiment to capture the heights. Lieutenant Colonel Schwartz 
charged with the 1st Battalion to the mentioned heights, and having sent out skirmishes, he captured it, both sides suffering heavy casualties. My regiment had too lost many people by now, and on the order of General Vasil Chikov, the enemy retreated, fighting back to the woods, where it dispatched skirmishers for cover and then joined a battalion of the lifeguard Izmailovsk Regiment. End quote. By the end of the battle, Udon reports that the regiment, which had begun the day with 143 NCOs, 53 musicians, 1,543 privates, had up to 400 killed and about 443 wounded, with 130 missing in action, a casualty rate of about 57%. The battle had continued all day, heavy French bombardments hitting the Russian Guard artillery. The Guard cavalry had had a busy afternoon, but we'll discuss them and we'll discuss that in the separate video. But ultimately, the Russians couldn't resist sustained French pressure and left the battlefield to Napoleon. This was no Austerlitz, however, and there was no panicked flight here. That evening, Roman Saltic, attached to French Imperial headquarters, overheard a conversation between Marshals Ney and Murat. Murat, that was hard work. I've never been in a battle like it, especially for artillery fire. At Elau, both sides fired plenty of round shot, but here we were so close that it was almost always canister. To which Ney replied, We haven't finished yet. The enemy must have lost tremendously, and we must have shaken his morale. We have to pursue and profit from our victory. Murat. But they've withdrawn in good order. Nay. Bon Dieu. Comme cela pu illitre après un tel massacre. Good God. How can it be that after such a slaughter? With apologies to my French-speaking listeners out there, I wanted to put that in the original French, I mean, well, sort of, my uh, <laughs> my version of the original French, because I think, for me, it's one of those absolutely world-famous quotes. It's like um, uh, like the reply to Shackleton's question of who won the war in 1916. It's It's one of those things that shows the nature of war had changed and nay, he hadn't quite got his head around yet. I mean, he certainly would. This was the first time that anyone had come to grips with this. And I think Ney was on the cutting edge of that. How, after such a massacre, could any army retreat in good order? Well, this was, this was now modern war. It wasn't war as they knew it. It wasn't the years of glory up to 1809. This was a new type of war. Anyway, anyway, sorry, that's a, a, an aside. The army and the guard withdrew in good order, and while the next day Napoleon would continue his advance towards Moscow, it was the last time the Russians would fight the French until the retreat. Again, despite the army being defeated, the guard came out of it well. Kutuzov wrote in his post-battle report, quote, The Ismailovsk and the Lithuanian regiments covered themselves with glory in full view of the whole army, end quote. The colonel of the Ismailovsk regiment, having lost 777 men, wrote, quote, The enemy fire destroyed our ranks, but failed to produce any disorder among the men. The line simply closed up again and maintained discipline as coolly as if they had been on musketry exercise, end quote. At one point, the battalion of the Ismailovsk formed line two ranks deep instead of the customary three due to the number of casualties they had suffered. After Borodino, the regiment was awarded with the St. George's colour. Following the burning of Moscow and the retreat of the Grand Armée, 1813 saw Russia go on the offensive, and with them a recently again enlarged guard. Two regiments from the elite 1st Grenadier Division, arguably a formation that was more had more battlefield power than the guard, actually. Uh, two regiments from the elite 1st Grenadier Division, the Life Guard, and we get to them at last, the Pavlovsky Grenadiers, were admitted to the guard in April, being classed as Young Guard in an echo of the French model. Also added, at least nominally, were the absolutely amazingly named the Grand Duchess Catherine's Guard Grenadier Battalion. This meant that the guard now consisted of eight regiments of either two or three battalions, leading the Guard Division to have about... 25 battalions of infantry and that's before we even get to the cavalry so a significant force as a borodino the guard would be used as a reserve and because the battles in which the full armies faced each other were successes for the allies the guard were not required to do much of the major fighting it's uh, it's interesting it's almost the reverse of when i did the french guard because they start to lose now the guard were used a lot more <laughs> 
Uh, that said, at the Battle of Krasny, during the French retreat, the Guard Jaegers captured two eagles and the remnants of the regiments that carried them. At the minor battle, well, I mean, I use the term loosely, in 1813, the minor battle of Kulm, a French battalion and one of the lifeguard Ismailovsk regiments advanced against each other, both having had a skirmish screen in front of them and being formed in column. Although the French pushed in the lower quality Russian skirmishes, they couldn't stop the Russian column. One of the officers of the regiment, L.A. Shimansky, wrote, quote, The guardsmen marched with the bayonet. A loud hoorah preceded this. Their commander rode ahead, and the French turned and fled. End quote. He continues, After the Russians caught up with a large number of the French, which had been held up by crossing a brook, Quote, where the French, having crowded, fell on one another. Here I saw for the first time how they were punished by bayonets. The Austrian Emperor, sorry, end quote. The Austrian Emperor Francis II was so impressed with the skill and courage of the Russian guard that he ordered a monument built on the spot to salute them. At the Battle of Dresden in August 1813, the guard infantry dressed in their great coats stayed in reserve, not being required to do much heavy lifting but they will be thrown back into combat at the Battle of the Nations, the Battle of Leipzig. As a quick aside, uh, d- uh, the Battle of Dresden, the Guard were dressed in greatcoats, a bit like the French at Waterloo, and all the rest of them, now I, I could be wrong in this, but certainly at Borodino and at Leipzig and uh, Austerlitz, they were in their full dress uniform. So again, for those painters out there, it's not like the Guard at Waterloo where they've got their greatcoats on. These guys looked their spangliest at all times except to Leipzig but they didn't really uh, sorry except at Dresden but they didn't really do anything in Dresden so anyway we're talking about Leipzig now and the easiest way I can describe the battle is to imagine in your mind a dartboard now the left hand side of the, the dartboard we can more or less ignore because that was cut off by the river Elsa but Leipzig imagine Leipzig as the bullseye the inner green ring, the one that surrounds... Sorry, the green rings on the dartboard, they're all fortified villages. With the inner ring, the one that's next to the bullseye, being the most heavily fortified. The next one's moderately, and then the outer one's the least fortified. But still fortified, don't get me wrong. The Allies are attacking from the outside of the dartboard towards the middle. Or, uh, you know, I mean, that's the best way I can describe it. I'm sure there's other ways out there. If you can think of a better way of describing it, stick it down in the comments below. The Russian guard were attacking from the south, where the number two on the dartboard would be. But uh, I, I guess it'd be five o'clock on a clock face would be, uh, would be the easiest way of describing where they were attacking from. The position that held the outer ring of the fences, the double two, as it were, And the first town that the Allies would need to capture in this southern sector was the small town of Guldengoss and the so-called University Wood that ran next to it. In amongst the Prussians were the 7th Reserve Infantry on their left and the 2nd West Prussian Infantry Regiment on their right were the Lifeguard Jaegers. And it was these men that would be called on to assault the town. Behind them, to be sent in as reserves, were four more battalions of guard and four more battalions of grenadiers, so that'll be of the 1st Grenadier Division. Initially, the assault on the town was a success, with the French being pushed out of the village at the point of a bayonet. But the Russians and Prussians pursued out onto the plain, and got caught up in Murat's massive cavalry charge, scattering them and allowing a successful French counterattack, which recaptured Golden Goss and the neighbouring woods. While the time of the heroes had long passed, With the death of La Salle in 1809, there were still legends to be made. One such was the man known as the Monument of 1812, General Nikolai Nikolaevich Ryevsky. Having received a bullet to the shoulder and head wound, leading his 2nd Grenadier Division, he rode up to the Guard Infantry, blood soaking through the hastily applied bandages. He looked to retake the ground they had lost, and with a cry of, I will lead you! Four guard regiments, the guard Jaegers, took their lead. The Pavlovsky, the lifeguard grenadiers and the Finland regiments all raised their traditional blood-curdling hoorah cry and stormed into the woods and village, not even stopping to fire. They were followed by von Yangau's three Prussian battalions and two additional battalions of Russian grenadiers. Despite heavy fighting, which saw General Ryevsky sustain another wound, 
The French could not stand up to the Imperial Guard and fell back towards Liebert Volkwitz. So that was the, the middle of the fortified villages. But the Russians would not be able to rest on their laurels. Napoleon sent his young guard to retake the village and would, along with the now rallied elements of the 16th Division. General Maison, who had been wounded in the last assault, stood tall in his stirrups and told his men, The decisive hour has now arrived for France. This evening we must either win or die. The attack was driven off before it could gain real momentum, however. A hastily formed grand battery of 80 pieces of Russian artillery decimated them before the Russian guard, supported by grenadiers, finished the job. The situation only worsened for the French after 12 Russian horse guns opened fire on their flank, defilading the French. But despite being forced back and heavy casualties, the French still, still did not break and began to slowly reform. About 5pm, the French again attacked Golden Gosse. Maison's 16th Division fought particularly well, but they were exhausted by this point. Despite that, the fighting was ferocious, and General de Division Maison was almost captured and barely escaped. The hero of Borodino, General Rayevsky, was wounded again as the Russians threw the French back with heavy casualties. The first day of the largest battle in history was over. In the south, where we've been focusing our story, the outer ring of villages had been taken by the Allies, but there were still two rings to go, including the heavily fortified inner ring, namely the village of Probs Fader. After a day which saw the armies rest, reorganise and resupply, dawn broke on the 18th of October 1813, and the killing began afresh. 55,000 men, commanded by Russian General Barclay de Tolle, formed into massive columns, converged to attack Probs Theda. The village was quite unusual in that they had constructed their walls out of timber and clay, meaning that cannonballs would punch straight through and cause little damage other than the hole actually created by the ball. Additionally, there was a very well-constructed stone garden wall that would be a, allow a great defensive position. Add this to the fact that the village was absolutely packed to the rafters with French troops, and that meant that General von Kleist, the Prussian that would be storming the village, wasn't super optimistic of success. But under the eyes of two emperors and one king, he ordered the assault. Similarly to Golden Goss two days before, the village would fall to the Prussians, only to be recaptured by the French. Four times this occurred, with the French getting increasingly desperate, including the fourth counter-attack made up of the middle guard, led by Napoleon himself. Seeing the French had sent in their final reserves, General Schwarzenberg begged the Tsar for the Russian guard. One final push would see it done, he exclaimed, but Alexander refused, and instead a mighty barrage hit the town, forcing the French to withdraw after darkness fell, burning 50 caissons and spiking a dozen guns. Sir Robert Wilson, who was present at Leipzig as British Commissioner, wrote of the 18th, quote, In spite of the ardent and persevering courage of the Allied troops, they could not carry a single one of the villages which the French proposed to hold as vital to their position. The action was closed by night, leaving to the French, and especially the defenders of Probs Theda, the glory of having inspired the generous envy of their enemies. The battle went in for a fourth day, while the Allies desperately hammering at the gates to catch a withdrawing French army. The vast majority of the fighting occurred to the north and east of the city of Leipzig itself, and the battered and exhausted Russian guard not being really required. The battle was over, and, despite a masterful defence, Napoleon was defeated. Finally, Bonaparte had been pushed back into France and soon the battles would be on his native soil. The next big one for the Russian guard was Le Rothier, where, in the heavy snow, they support an attack by Württembergers. This battle was a mere appetiser for the final stand of the First Empire, the Battle of Paris. Of the 100,000 men converging on the capital of France, 63,000 were Russian. Seeing the windmills and the heights of Montmartre, many broke ranks. Paris! Paris! they cried. They knew that the end was literally in sight. But Paris was not Moscow, and there was nowhere for the French armies to retreat. There were some 20,000 troops under Joseph Bonaparte in place to defend the city, and the goddess of victory would demand one more blood sacrifice. Again, the fighting was fierce, but the Russian guard were little required. Soon the war and the reign of Napoleon Bonaparte I was over. But our story of the Russian guard doesn't quite end there. <laughs> 
The occupation of Paris was a time for subtlety for the Allies. Alexander referred to himself not as conqueror, but as liberator, and he staged a parade through the city with the Russian guard infantry in the very middle of it. A guards officer, Glinka, fell in love with Paris, its history, its culture, its fashions, its jeu de vivre, and of course, its women. He was not alone in this, and it would cause serious problems back home. At a tide, at a time where the sacred heart of Russia, Moscow, had been just a, a medieval village, now burnt to the ground. Paris, and then later when they went to London with Alexander, must have absolutely blown these men's minds. Alexander Bestuzinev asked, Officers, quote, Officers and soldiers had seen how people lived outside Russia. By comparison, the question naturally arose, Why isn't it like this here? End quote. Having won the great patriotic war, why was it that the victors lived in cities straight out of the Middle Ages, while the vanquished get to live in places like Paris? In fact, there was, I've read, serious consideration and serious high-level discussions about whether the Allies should actually destroy Paris or not. Partly in revenge for the burning of Moscow, I think. However, back to the Russian Guard, and many officers having seen what Europe had to offer, began to consider the possibility of bringing a second enlightenment to Russia. What Peter the Great had done in the late 17th, early 18th century, these guys could do at the start of the 19th. While Peter had built a Western-style capital in St. Petersburg, the country was still painfully backward. While he had transplanted the science, technology and culture of the early 18th century into Russia, that's where Russia had stayed. These guard officers wanted to bring 100 years of cultural development they had seen in the West back. But Alexander, frightened by the liberal movements in Germany, became even more conservative, leaving the young nobles in a position very much at odds with the dominant system. In fact, in 1825, more than 2,000 soldiers in Senate Square in St. Petersburg took part in an uprising, but due to lack of unity of command and little support from the civilians, this was to fail. After that, harsh discipline was reintroduced. The Russian Guard, now a finely honed instrument of war, was considered too dangerous to have around, so terms of service were slashed, allowing many guardsmen to return home, and parades, drill, and door guarding became the order of the day. So, there we have it. The end of the epic tale of Russia's guard infantry. I will be doing a second part on the cavalry, so I hope you'll join me for that. And we'll look at, we'll probably end up doing a third video where we look at the black powder rules for the guard and the infantry. I'll combine those into one third video. This one's just under an hour at the moment, so I think that's probably long enough. Uh, if you want to make sure you don't miss those videos, please subscribe if you haven't already. Um, it really does help the channel grow. This month is going to be Russia month. I've got the second part of this to start collecting a battle report to come. So if you don't want to miss any of that, please subscribe. It really helps the channel. Uh, I've also got a weekend away coming. I'm hopefully going to be doing some live streams from that. So please, uh, please sign up for that if it sounds like something you'd be interested in. Researching this topic on the Russians is quite an interesting one. Because they didn't fight alongside the British, it's, uh, it's quite difficult to find sources out there in English. But uh, I hope you enjoyed a, a little quote heavier than normal video today. Uh, I really liked the quotes. I particularly like Goetz's quotes from Auslitz. I thought he was particularly fun. But thank you very much for listening. I'm just waffling now. Thank you for listening. Hope to see you in the next video. And goodbye. <laughs>